this hearing will now come back to order. The chair now recognizes the second panel, the distinguished uh, and honorable governor of the state of South Carolina, Nikki Haley, the honorable Alan Wilson, attorney general of South Carolina. Pursuant to the rules of this committee, we ask that all witnesses be sworn. Would you please rise to take the oath? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Let the record uh, reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, Governor, Attorney General, you have only one problem with this wonderful facility, and that is that the amplification is limited and you are facing away from the people around you. So to the greatest extent possible, think of this as a rally <laughs> without microphones. <laughs> We now recognize the distinguished governor of the state of South Carolina. Thank you, and thank you to the panel. Thank you for having us. Welcome to South Carolina for those that are visiting. Um, we hope that you will come back often. And thank you for allowing us the opportunity to speak with you today. You know, the issue that we are talking about right now is not just a South Carolina issue. This issue faces every governor in every state in the country. And what I can tell you is what our story is. In 2009, we were facing great challenges. We had high unemployment, we had poverty issues, we had budget issues just like every other state, and we were blessed to see a great American company decide to look at South Carolina to come here. And since that company has decided to create jobs here, we have seen a wealth of companies coming through here that have decided to come. And the reason they come to South Carolina is because the cost of doing business is low. We give them a great trained workforce. Our quality of life is great, and we have companies that understand what it means to have a great relationship between their employers and their employees. And so Boeing decided to come here, they created a thousand jobs, and it energized this state, and it energized our people in a way that we hadn't seen in a long time. And since then, we've seen lots of suppliers come in, we've seen the fact that Boeing out of all the contracts they have, 91% of their contracts are with South Carolina businesses, which is a great testament to Boeing. It's a great testament to the businesses that it can create. But what I have also seen is, as governor, my job is to do whatever I can to create jobs. I never thought that the president and his appointees at the National Labor Relations Board would be one of the biggest opponents that we would have. If you tell a great American company like Boeing, that they cannot create jobs in South Carolina. All you are doing is incentivizing those companies to go overseas. And I am saying we can't have that. It's an attack on our employers in this country that are trying to keep business in America. It's an attack on the employees who appreciate the fact that they have jobs to go to. It's an attack on states that work hard to make sure that we keep the cost of doing business low, that we continue to have a pro-business environment, and that we do everything that makes America great. And I will tell you that I had um, was blessed to be able to attend the ribbon cutting of Boeing last week. And before we even took the stage, I had an employee come up to me and say, I love my job. This is the best job I have ever had. And I announced that when I was speaking to the people um, of the company and to all the visitors that were there. And after I got off stage, the number of employees that came and said, thank you for fighting for us. We love our jobs. We want to keep our jobs. It was overwhelming. And so what I would say is I wish this was being held in the Boeing plant because they would speak for me and I wouldn't have to say a word. But what I will tell you is while South Carolina is the first state to deal with this, while Boeing is the first company to deal with this, this needs to be the last time we deal with this. If we are going to prosper, if our economy is going to prosper, we cannot allow a federal government or unelected bureaucrats to come in and start pushing their way in on our American companies. As governors, it makes it incredibly hard. For companies, it makes it incredibly hard. And we appreciate you taking the time and, and for your help in solving this problem. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Mr. Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the invitation by you and this committee. This hearing is about far more than Boeing or South Carolina. In fact, it's even more about the unions. It's about an individual's right to allocate capital in the way that they believe best serves their business. As Attorney General, it is my sworn duty as South Carolina's Chief Legal Officer to defend our Constitution, our state, and even our citizens. 
Fifteen attorneys general representing both right to work and union states have joined me in opposing the NLRB's complaint against Boeing. This complaint is without legal merit or precedent and threatens the company's $6.1 billion annual economic impact on South Carolina's economy. The draconian remedy, as some have called it, sought by the acting general counsel would allow the board to choose where a private business may locate its capital. Neither the board nor the federal government should make private business decisions. It is business that creates capital. It is capital that creates jobs, not the government. Since its adoption in 1935, the National Labor Relations Act has never been so distorted that it would destroy a company's ability to make sound business decisions. The act imposes few constraints upon the free flow of capital to a right to work state. Legal precedents clearly demonstrate that Boeing's decision to expand to South Carolina is, in fact, lawful. Boeing did not eliminate union jobs or remove work from Washington State. It merely created new work here in North Charleston. Under board law, it must be shown that existing work, existing work, was eliminated, subcontracted, or relocated. In fact, even legal experts who support the board concede this action is unprecedented. The board's audacity to file this complaint constitutes the shot heard around the business world. Companies around the globe are thinking twice about locating or expanding operations in this country, especially expansion into Union States. Based on its complaint and recent memos, the board appears anxious to challenge any business expansion it deems detrimental to unions as unfair labor practice. One can only imagine the chilling effect this will have on business leaders' desire to expand capital and investment in our economy. <clears throat> capital investment, as well as fundamental business decisions related to unionization, are not anti-union animus under Section 8A3. While Boeing has not discouraged union membership in Everett, Washington, the Supreme Court has upheld legitimate business interest <coughs> even though union membership may have been discouraged. How could a rational person legitimately disagree with Boeing's decision when looking at South Carolina's business climate, its labor stability, and its $900 million incentive package? The Acting General Counsel's theory under Section 8A3 that Boeing's actions are inherently destructive of unionization is nothing but an attempt to thwart a company's fundamental business judgment. That theory is inapplicable to Boeing's decision to expand here in South Carolina. In the words of the Supreme Court, a business may make a prediction as to the precise effects it believes unionization will have on its company. Such predictions, including those concerning work stoppages, are protected by the First Amendment. Any claim by the Acting General Counsel that statements made by Boeing officials were coercive and thus violate Section 8A1 are patently incorrect. The last work stoppage cost Boeing $1.8 billion and caused customers to question whether or not to buy from Boeing ever again. Despite this fact, Boeing desired, thank goodness, to keep production in Washington State. But despite that desire, the union refused to assure labor stability. Furthermore, Boeing's collective bargaining agreement which, agreement, which dates back to 1965, guarantees the company's right to determine where work is to be performed. The Supreme Court has recognized that management must have the flexibility to make business decisions without being second-guessed as unfair labor practice. The board is ignoring the rule of law and filing a complaint without precedent. The consequences of the board's actions, despite its intent, would abolish a company's discretion to make those business decisions. In 1788, Alexander Ham Hamilton warned that the freedom of the states can be subverted by the federal head, and such subversion is repugnant to every political calculation. Our founding fathers went to great lengths to prevent an out-of-control federal government from nullifying private business decisions. We, too, must go to great lengths to ensure the founders' promise is honored. The board's complaint is a step toward radically rewriting the NLRA, the board chairman has testified to Congress that she seeks to restructure the act as a collective action to redress economic inequalities. Unless deterred, this bureaucratic agency's action will further paralyze our nation's economy. Action must be taken in the halls of Congress. I ask this committee to join me and fellow attorneys general around the country 
in an effort to preserve economic freedom in America. I thank you for this time, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. I thank you. I'll recognize myself for the first round of questions, but before I do that, I'd ask unanimous <coughs> consent that our letter, or, or sorry, that the governor's letter, along with other, uh, a whole lot of other governors, be placed in the record at this time. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, governor, like me, I understand you're not an attorney, but you do understand business very well. If the decision by BMW were covered under the same thinking that NLRB is applying to Boeing, isn't it true that basically BMWs would all be produced in Germany? That's exactly right. And BMW officials would tell you that. And if every company decides or is forced to decide that they have to remain where their entrenched union is, even if it means that they're unable to expand or take advantages of new and emerging markets both here and around the world, wouldn't that be detrimental to this state? But wouldn't it also be detrimental to companies like General Motors that choose to set up factories in other countries, including China, so that they can expand to take advantage of those markets? Yes, and Mr. Chairman, I actually think it would be more detrimental to places like Washington who don't have the right to work laws because they would basically be scared to ever go into those states because they think they could never expand outside of those states. You know, Governor, I'll share something with you from my days in electronics. Uh, electronics companies do not wisely set up in Germany because they had those laws. It was impossible to get rid of anything once you went into Germany. So I even was part on the board when we acquired a company that had operations in Germany. We didn't operate it one day because we operated it one day we own those employees. And it's really tough to say we're not going to ever touch that facility because if we did, we'd own it, we couldn't get rid of it, where we quite frankly would have been happy to try to reorganize it, but we didn't want to own it. That's what the people of, of Washington will face if this continues. Uh, General Wilson, I've got a couple of questions for you. I'm going to deviate a little bit. You're also dealing with your right to a secret ballot here, aren't you, with the NLRB? That is correct. And in your knowledge as an attorney and, and, and from a constitutional standpoint, has there ever been any question about who conducts elections in the United States? Isn't that, hasn't that, there's no, never been such a thing as a federal election. Every state conducts its own elections pursuant to the Constitution. And isn't every state conducting secret ballots for their, all of their elected officials, including all of us on the dais? Well, absolutely, that is correct. So the NLRB is trying to, in fact, in fact, prevent you from doing something that has been done constitutionally for all elections of all elected officials since our founding. It is, it is my personal belief, Mr. Chairman, that an individual's vote, whether it be for a, a member of Congress or whether it be to unionize, that your vote be between you and your maker, <coughs> not be between you and your employer or you and a mob, uh, I said mob, union boss. Uh, it shouldn't be between anybody. Say mom. That's okay. Before you slip a show. Uh, uh, General Wilson, that may be popular here, but it, it might not. It might not fly in, in Seattle, but we understand. But, but we believe that if someone wants to unionize, they have that right, and they should be able to afford that right, and it should be reflected in their vote, not by intimidation from the employer's perspective or a union's perspective. Well, General, uh, Governor, this morning uh, I chose to go to Boeing and go to the new building. And as I'm going through the line, <coughs> meeting with employees, uh, no, no management picking who I walked up to, I ran into a woman named Tina. And uh, she was very quiet, wasn't, wasn't in management. Uh, and to my amazement, I managed to pick a woman who is fourth generation Boeing employee, who in fact, uh, family roots are all in Seattle and she told me something not because the company told her to but because she simply believes it that she is so excited to be working here a place that she was not transferred she chose to live here and simply got a job here as a fourth generation Boeing employee uh, she told me this place is the future this is how we're going to continue to be Boeing in America for the rest of my life and the next generation and I'm not going to forget what she told me because she said something great about your state. She said this place is the future of avionics. This is a place where we can continue to export. And I think you should be very proud of Tina and all the workforce I saw there today. And thank you for being a good working state at a place where people choose to come from all over the country. Thank you very much. With that, I recognize the ranking lady for her uh, round. Thank you very much, and I appreciate very much your testimony.
and congratulations on your thank election. Thank you very much. Thank you. We were even watching it in New York <laughs> with great interest. Um, first of all, Governor, uh, your claim to support a, a worker's right to join or not join a union, you've said, but here is a, a collection of, of quotes and statements made by you in recent months about unions. And I quote, there is no secret, I do not like unions, end quote. Uh, secondly, quote, come show your support for a great South Carolina company. Say no to the unions bullying our businesses, end quote. Uh, quote, we will continue to do everything we can. Uh, stand with uh, companies who understand what it means to take care of their employees without the interference of a meddlesome, self-serving union, end quote. Quote, the more heavy-handed the unions are with us, the more we're going to talk smack back, end quote. Uh, these quotes, I would say, is fair to say that they do not portray a neutral uh, employee choice position. Rather, they clearly articulate an anti-union posture, which you have repeatedly communicated to workers in your state. So my question to you is, do you think workers can make a free choice about joining or not joining a union? which they have a federally protected right to do when the chief executive of their state is so aggressively anti-union and has publicly announced steps undertaken by the state to help companies keep unions out of South Carolina. Thank you, Congresswoman, and welcome to South Carolina. <coughs> Thank you. Um, yes, I did make all of those statements, um, and the reason that I've made those statements is when I see the NLRB doing this to Boeing, they give me great reason to say them. And I will tell you that South Carolina is not a state that appreciates being bullied. Our companies don't appreciate being bullied, and the unions have not shown us in any way that they have respect for our employees. What we have is a great relationship between our employers and our employees. It's a direct relationship. It's one that I will continue to protect under the right to work laws that we have. Any employee has the ability to join a union. What you will find in South Carolina is very few employees want to. And the reason they don't want to is because they love the companies they work for. You can go to our Boeing facility here and they don't want to be taken by the unions. They want to be made sure that they have the right to choose and what they choose is not to be a part of a union. Gentlewoman, yield for a moment? No, no, I will not. Are you sure? I, I will at the end of my time. Thank you, ma'am. First, uh, well, the, in our, the, the case that's being brought is on due process and the right to protest. It's a constitutionally protected right. That's, that, that's what the case is. But uh, Attorney General uh, Wilson, you keep referring to the work in South Carolina as, quote, new work. But isn't it uh, true that Boeing has publicly announced that it will close the surge line uh, one of two assembly lines in, in Washington State when its South Carolina plant is fully operational. I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of that comment by Boeing, uh, but I am aware of the line of logic that Representative Scott went in the last panel, um, how it's hard to transfer something that's not in existence and how it's hard to retaliate when you're adding jobs to a company in, the, in state number one, which is Washington State. So. Uh, I, I'm not aware of the, of the comment that you claim Boeing made, but I am aware of the result is that Boeing has netted 2,000 jobs, South Carolina has netted 1,000 jobs. Well, also, I, I'd like to ask you as an officer of the court, um, you must uh, disapprove law breaking as a predicate for economic development. And, and as an officer of the court, you believe it's appropriate for a governmental entity to advocate law breaking as an economic development strategy. I'm, I'm sorry, say that again? Well, if Boeing has broken the law and illegally <coughs> retaliated against Washington State workers, wouldn't you as an officer of the court have to oppose such actions? Well, if Boeing has retaliated by adding 2,000 jobs in South Carolina, 1,000 uh, 1, jobs in Washington State, $6.1 billion investment in this state, then I hope Boeing continues to retaliate against us and every other state in the country. <laughs> 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 Well, do you support due process and the right to protest I support protected you. under the Constitution of our country? I support the due process of the 1,000 jobs that are trying to be taken from North Charleston, South Carolina. The case is about due process and the right to protect uh, 
the, the right of workers to protest, which has been a, a right that has led to many uh, protections for working people in America. My time has expired. Mr. Gowdy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would yield to my uh, distinguished colleague from the great state of South Carolina, Mr. Tim Scott. Thank you, Congressman. May I ask the Governor just a couple questions real quick? Yes. Governor, you and I served in the State House together, is that correct? Yes, we did. Uh, you were there for six or eight years? Six. So <laughs> when the Boeing plant opened in North Charleston, you were a member of the State House? That's right. Uh, the employees at the Union plant, uh, at the Boeing plant decided to unionize. Did you try to stop that? I did not. So you are fully aware of the fact that the employees of the Boeing plant decided to start a union, but yet, even though all your comments were just <coughs> brought to our attention, you did nothing to stop them from having the exercise of their constitutional rights. We have strong people in South Carolina. They're going to do whatever they want to do. And you support that? I absolutely support Are you that. sure? I, with everything I've gotten, I won't make any more comments like that, but yes, I do. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Uh, welcome, Governor Haley. Thank, uh, you, thank you for your leadership on this issue thank and your presence today. I uh, hope shows the rest of the world how important this issue is to our state. So thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Uh, to my former colleague, uh, Attorney General Wilson, thank you for your service to our state and your service as a very distinguished prosecutor for a number of years. Uh, thank you. There's a, just for the record, uh, if it matters, search line doesn't open until 2012 so I think we have yet another pleonism of something closing before it opens but there have been several of those uh, here today General Wilson it strikes me that this case is three-dimensional there's a practical uh, aspect which the Boeing employees so eloquently set out earlier this morning there's a patently transparently political aspect to this and there's a legal aspect to it the political aspect to me is uh, this administration is no longer content with merely class warfare or generational warfare. We're now going to inject uh, regional warfare into the equation, pitting workers who desperately need work in Washington with those who desperately need it in South Carolina. That's the politics of it. I want to talk to you for a second about the legal part of it. Um, have you come across any case law in your exemplary career as an attorney that suggest you cannot state a historical fact without being uh, having a complaint lodged against you by the NLRB? I'm not aware of any. It is it is a historical fact that there have been work stoppages in Washington State, correct? That is correct. And the mere uh, recitation of a historical fact, God help us, if that constitutes a an actionable uh, incident by the NLRB, would you agree? I do. I wonder if it's okay if Boeing executives think it, so long as they just don't say it. I mean, can, can they think, uh, you know, we've had four work stoppages and we have a customer who's threatening to no longer do business with us. Is it okay to think it? Is that where they messed up, that they actually said something? Representative, it is my opinion, based on Mr. Solomon's testimony, that it seems to be a thought police type situation here. Um, somebody is, that runs a company, and whether you're the president of Boeing or the chief executive officer of Bubba's Feed and Seed, if you have a business, you should be able to talk to your employees freely and openly about the consequences of actions. Uh, union employees have every right to strike. Uh, that is a protected right that I agree with, but they do not have a right to escape the consequences of their actions. If uh, a Boeing executive says, we cannot afford work stoppages, that should send a reasonable person that has some modicum of common sense, that should send a signal to them that if they can't afford to do something, that means their business model is going to implode and jobs will dissipate. So uh, I don't begrudge any company for taking whatever actions are necessary if it's a legitimate business interest. Um, the Supreme Court has held that uh, you are allowed to make comments if, under First Amendment. As a, a CEO of a company, you are allowed to make First Amendment uh, statements reflecting facts, work stoppages, $1.8 billion it cost us, we can't continue to operate like this. The Supreme Court protects that kind of speech. What I find interesting is is that, and even, even I know we saw a clip earlier, the representative Well, I'll ask you split. about that, because Timmy took all my time, which I hope he'll give me some of it back. <laughs> I want to ask you about that, because you are, you are a very distinguished prosecutor. You're familiar with the rule of completeness. We could never get away with what, Bo, with what the NLRB did in their complaint, which is hijack certain out-of-context quotes, put it in a complaint, and then treat it like it's serious. Uh, you've seen the full context of the quotes, right? Uh, I have read the full context of the statements. I, I do not recall every 
uh, last point in the statement. If we were in a court of law, because I've heard a lot about due process and fundamental fairness, if we were in a court of law, that entire video would have been shown under the rule of completeness because it's patently unfair to select out certain quotes. Is that I certainly true? would have objected to it without yes, being. And your objection would have been sustained. Uh, with that, uh, my time is up. Thank you. The delegate from the District of Columbia, Ms. North. May I remind the former U.S. Attorney that a complaint is a short statement. Uh, only in the barest statement of what you mean to prove, and a complaint would not contain <coughs> the whole document. That document, <coughs> sir, as you well know, would come out of trial, and we have to avoid a trial here. I, I, I welcome both of these officers of the state. While your, um, your, your own uh, testimony uh, might be predictable, uh, uh, protect, pr protecting your state, uh, your, your testimony is certainly understandable. Um, uh, Governor Haley, uh, you certainly have my congratulations. So far as I know, you're the first woman um, elected in her own right as governor of a southern state. That is a breakthrough and one that women of uh, every conceivable political party would want to uh, salute. I will have no questions for you. You're not a lawyer. Mr. Wilson, you and I belong to uh, something of the same fraternity, so to speak, because we're both members of the bar. Yes, sir. I have tried to confine my statements to process uh, because of the capacity of a hearing by a political body to taint the process which is now in operation. Uh, you would not want that either because you surely want this to be over and we don't want to have bases for uh, other matters to uh, be uh, alleged in the, the nature of a complaint during this complaint. On outcome, I just want to say for the record, uh, I'm not sure whether you are aware, but in cases involving capital investment uh, and the National Labor Relations Act uh, are among the most difficult cases under the Act. Um, most assuredly, they are not immune from the act, but they are saturated with facts uh, and very difficult. Moreover, I want to say for the record that while there's been discussion of nothing but remedy here, which state should get the jobs, the remedy section of this action would be, uh, uh, would be, um, heard uh, in, uh, entirely differently from the violation section of the action. Isn't that true, uh, 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 General Wilson? That, that even if there were a violation, there is no certainty that, these, that the remedy would be what the prosecutor, in this case the counsel, uh, wishes, which is the jobs themselves in one form or fashion to, to be in uh, uh, South Carolina or, or uh, sorry, Washington State. I, I'm, and I, I beg your forgiveness, Representative Norman. I don't believe I understand the question. Are you asking me as it pertains to the remedy, what the remedy would be? Violation, so that we don't confuse that even <laughs> if there is a violation of the National Labor Relations Act, it does not follow that the remedy would be to extract the jobs from one location to the other. That's there, there, could be a, there could be any any, any number of different remedies that the trier of fact could insist upon. Isn't that not the case? Representative, my fear is, is that there could be other remedies, but the, the effect of the complaint, what the complaint asks for is, in, in essence, that the, that the Boeing plant be closed and be moved back to Washington State. My concern is the chilling effect that this action is having, not just across South Carolina, Washington State, but throughout the United States and throughout Mr. the world. Mr. Wilson, every time that a prosecutor, I'm sorry my time is limited, uh, brings a case, he will chill something and often the prosecutor loses. I, I, this is America, after all. What the prosecutor wants and what the law finds are, are two different things. Very often, that's the difference between us and the rest of these, these people who don't believe in due process. You say the act in, in your prepared statement the act imposes few constraints upon the free flow of capital uh, to a right to work state. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, do, uh, uh, legal precedents clearly demonstrate that Boeing's decision to expand to South Carolina is 
lawful, would you not agree that though you argue that as a prosecutor, that's a typical prosecutorial statement, would you not agree that that is a, a question for the trier of fact? Representative Norton, uh, I have met with numerous business officials throughout the state and, and, and country, and the punitive measures right now are being realized. I'm asking you, sir, is that not a question? I, I understand your view. I'm not taking exception to your view. My question is, is that statement that it clearly uh, demonstrates uh, that Boeing's decision uh, is, 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 is lawful, is that not a question for the trier of fact? I would dispute it to the degree that it, when it's prosecutorial misconduct, it should be challenged. Are you alleging that there has been prosecutorial Absolutely. Well, would you name what the, what the misconduct the, the, has been? Have the you general, not been here for the last 20, 30 minutes? Have you the, not been here the for the last time, four hours? The general what is the <laughs> prosecutorial the, misconduct? The general lady's time misconduct has expired. By the prosecutor. Name the general lady the will suspend. Name the general the lady's time has expired. At this that, point. Is, that is a terrible allegation to make unsupport, unsupported and for you to let him get off without telling us what the misconduct the is, lady, Mr. Chairman. The general lady from the District of Columbia is happy to seek someone to yield to her if she would like to continue her time, but she is out of time. The chair would now recognize the gentleman from you the You've allowed everybody Texas, else to Mr. respond Fairbairn. to the question. And you're not allowing him to respond to the question. I asked the question the, in time. I, I would advise. You, and, and the chairman the allowed, will suspend. Once the question was asked in time, the question the has general allowed lady will suspend. the response to be made. The general lady will suspend. If you would like to seek time from another member, you are welcome to do so. I seek time from you, Mr. Chairman, for it's fairness. It's not my time. To respond to, to, to a fair I don't need any lectures. I don't need any lectures on fairness. You're getting one respect. right here, Mr. Well, Chairman. I don't, I don't need one from anybody. You need them from a lot of right. people. Mr. Ferrethole, the gentleman from Texas, you are recognized. Thank you very much. I'm going to take this back up to the cruising altitude of 30,000 feet. <laughs> And go and move up to the big picture questions. Uh, Governor Haley, can you talk for a second about some of the things that you've done here in uh, South Carolina to create jobs and some of the uh, some of the laws and policies you have in effect to do that? Yes, thank you, Congressman, and welcome to South Carolina. We thank appreciate you. you being here. You know, South Carolina, since I've taken office in January, we have recruited, created, um, expanded 7,000 additional jobs to South Carolina just <coughs> since January. And the reason is the cost of doing business is low. We just passed stronger tort reform. We've got a director of um, labor that has just reduced fees and regulations for our businesses. We understand what it means to have a pro-business state. So it's workers' comp reform, it's tort reform, it's making sure our taxes are low, it's making sure that we stay competitive, it's making sure that we provide companies the trained workforce that they need. That's why they come to South Carolina. And then they see our beaches and our mountains and that's just an added given. Uh, <laughs> now, I, I, I assume that as, as, as a politician and a governor, you kind of follow what's going on in Washington, D.C. Uh, you said you've, uh, you've got reasonable taxes. I, I think we've got a call for higher taxes from Washington, D.C. I think you've got, uh, you, you said you're trying to reduce regulations. I think we can see that all government agencies in Washington right now are trying to increase the uh, increase. You've got tort reform uh, that you've passed. Uh, we're not talking about that in D.C. And you're talking about a spirit of cooperation with businesses. And if you look at Washington, I think you'll see the exact opposite, this case being one uh, of, of adversarial. So y'all are creating jobs while the, at, a, at a very high rate, as, uh, as we are in the state of Texas. We've basically got the same climate that you guys got. And in fact, in the past few years, 37% of the jobs created in this country were created in Texas with just those things, low taxes, low regulation, tort reform, and cooperation. Do you think there might be a concerted effort on the part of the government to see that states like South Carolina and Texas uh, have a hard time creating jobs because it disproves some of the things that the current administration is trying to implement in Washington, D.C.? Well, first of all, I will tell you that Texas is one that I enjoy competing with, and I continue to tell Governor Perry I'm taking all his jobs away from him. Um, but having said that, I will tell you that with all due respect, Washington is dysfunctional. And everything that I have tried to do as a governor, whether it is to fight health care, um, D.C. has continued, and the president has continued to fight and push mandates on us. Whether it is to create jobs, he's continuing to allow cases like the NLRB to create 
um, problems with our companies. Whether it is with illegal immigration, he has gotten in the way of allowing us to enforce that. And so I will tell you that with a governor, whether it's Texas or South Carolina, we have a job to do, and that's to create jobs. And we have gotten no help from Washington. Uh, on the same, uh, on the on, on the same path. To realizing that job creation is really the most important thing in this country right now. Every person that uh, we get back to work uh, saves us money, brings money in as new uh, taxpayers and grows, uh, grows the economy. And I'm hoping we can get the federal government to act more like uh, South, uh, South Carolina and Texas than, uh, uh, than we are right now. Uh, that being said, uh, y'all can have the 787. We're looking at the 797. So, <laughs> you know, anybody here from Boeing, uh, we'd love to have you in Texas. Uh, <laughs> with that, I'll, uh, I, I'll yield the... Stay away from that. We're not going to let that happen. <laughs> <laughs> with that, I'll yield the uh, rest of my time to the uh, acting chair. I thank the gentleman from Texas. Uh, General Wilson, you, you received a question uh, trying to link up the allegations of the complaint with the remedy SALT. Uh, would you agree with me that the remedy sought is illustrative of the intent of the complainer? Uh, you and I didn't seek death penalty for auto theft, did we? That is correct. We don't seek death penalty for shoplifting. The remedy sought has to be commiserate with the alleged offense. And the fact remains that the NLRB sought essentially a death penalty for this state when they fashioned their remedy. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. All right, I would uh, at this point uh, rec uh, recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Governor, General. Um, there, are, there are aspects of this uh, discussion that can get very heated. I understand there's a thousand jobs at stake here, and I, I respect that uh, people in South Carolina are fighting for their constituents because that's what you're supposed to do. Uh, I, I'm just concerned, though, in the heat of the moment that statements don't go out that later on could, um, uh, if, if not corrected or amended, could be the basis for uh, distractions. Uh, and so I just want to just ask, to ask <coughs> respectfully ask uh, General Wilson, uh, the statement about prosecutorial misconduct. Are, are, is that is that a global statement or I, I'm, I just I just want to make sure that we don't get ourselves in a situation where you're vulnerable to sanctions because of of, of a charge that you know may not be substantiated my uh, my, my comments were global in nature and not to be spe specifically targeted toward any anyone's integrity okay, okay. I, I just I, I but just thank you okay. I can I can expand. No, no, I, that that's what I was hoping to hear. Okay. Uh, I I want to say that um, um, th there are a couple of questions that were asked by my colleagues here that I've sought answers to, uh, and I'm just going to use this time to go over the territory. Uh, th there's been a suggestion that Boeing was uh, only transferring new work, not work that already exists in Washington, and, and I uh, I had I had inquired of the uh, IAM, and, and uh, what they've said is that uh, Boeing is running two assembly lines in Washington, a line that can produce se uh, seven 787s per month, and a surge line that's intended to produce three 787s per month, although it has capacity for more, and a Boeing has announced it will close the surge line if and when it starts building uh, uh, the uh, three 787s per month in South Carolina, uh, uh, clearly a transfer of existing work. Uh, and the next uh, a question I had uh, related to um, uh, the statement about Boeing having added jobs in Puget Sound so that uh, uh, the workers there haven't been harmed. Uh, the, what I've learned is that's uh, not true, that as Boeing has admitted to the press, its strategy to outsource all 787 parts and sub-assemblies only doing final assembly in Washington has been a supply chain disaster. The companies had to hire a large temporary workforce to rework a large number of partially assembled 787s as the company still tries to complete them. Once these pro those problems are solved, the extra jobs in the Puget Sound will vanish and all of the jobs in the surge line will also go away if and when Boeing uh, opens up that line in South Carolina and that Boeing's retaliation in Washington will have caused a major loss of work and jobs. So I just wanted to get that on, on the record. Um, I want to ask the uh, Governor, 
Uh, Governor, do you, um, do, do you believe that workers have a right to organize? Yes. Do they have a right to collective bargaining? Yes. And do they have a right to strike? Yes. And uh, you're familiar with the National Labor Relations Act? Yes. And, and you're familiar that uh, employers are forbidden to engage in coercion, intimidation, retaliation? Yes. And, and if, if you had, had learned that an employer had engaged in um, uh, retaliation for a statutorily permitted action on the part of workers, uh, you, you as, as, as governor, uh, you would want to see um, the law enforced, would you not? Well, I think it's, you know, you have to see what retaliation is. Um, what I will tell you is that what I have witnessed is absolutely un-American. And when what, do you, we, what do you mean on American? When you have a National Labor Relations Board that is getting, um, that is actually going against a great American company like Boeing and telling them that they cannot create jobs, the precedent that that sends to any company looking to create jobs in this country, the precedent that that sends to any company looking to create jobs in any other state is terrible and the fact fact that Governor, we have allowed I've, got, this I've got 30 seconds yes. left I just want to say this that 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 the issue here uh, is uh, whether or not Boeing retaliated against workers for exercising their protected rights against the law we can agree that Boeing is a good company but the question is in this case it's a narrow question did they did they violate the National Labor Relations Act by uh, by threatening that you know to, to leave one area uh, in exchange, you know, and uh, if they did not uh, get their way. Now, now this becomes relevant because, let's face it, at somewhere down the line, you, you as governor uh, could be faced with a, a case uh, that could be similar if someone wants to threaten to move jobs out of South Carolina because you've got jobs here, big industries that people later on just pulled out. And, you know, corporations have a lot of power in that regard. I, I, I want to thank you for your indulgence. Thank you. Uh, Your Honor and uh, General Wilson, thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, could I just comment on that quickly? Uh, My yeah. time's expired. I, the I gentleman's mean, time has expired. Uh, perhaps uh, Representative Scott would be gracious enough to allow you to expound on that uh, when his time. At this point, I would recognize the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Braley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I was struck by the irony of your comment accusing the Obama administration and President Obama of regional warfare. We are, after all, in Charleston, South Carolina, and Charleston knows a thing or two about regional warfare. There's a little <laughs> incident here 150 years ago that gave new meaning to the concept of regional warfare. But I think the important thing that I need to share with you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and with the governor is that on behalf of all Iowans, I take great pride in the fact that Big Red was returned to the state of South Carolina and the Citadel after careful and meticulous preservation by the Iowa Historical Society. So that is one positive thing that can bring us all together. <laughs> um, <laughs> Governor, let me start with you. Um, Representative Scott made a comment in his opening statement accusing the NLRB of using your tax dollars in an unprecedented way. And my question for you is did the state of South Carolina use state taxpayers' dollars in an unprecedented way to lure Boeing's production line here? No. So the question I'm asking you, is Boeing the biggest welfare queen of the state of North Carolina, or has someone received more than $900 million in incentives from the state to locate here? I mean, you know, as we do with all companies when we're trying to get them to come to South Carolina, we, we compete with all of your states to try and get them to come. And so sometimes we do use economic development incentives to do that or job incentives to do right. that. And my question is, is this $900 billion million package the biggest incentive given to anybody to locate here in the state of South Carolina that you know of? Yes. Um, one of the questions that I have uh, for you, Mr. Attorney General, is based upon a statement that was in your uh, prepared remarks where you indicated it was your duty as South Carolina's chief legal officer to defend your constitution, your state, and your citizens. Do you remember that? I do. 
Did you also swear an oath to defend the Constitution and the laws of the United States when you were sworn in as Attorney General? I did. Okay. So even though your job is as Attorney General of the State of California, uh, excuse me, South Carolina, <laughs> forgive me. It's okay. Uh, Good state. You also have a corresponding duty to recognize that South Carolina, at least since it came back into the Union, has operated within a federal system where there are corresponding duties and responsibilities of elected officials here in the state. Uh, that is correct. And one of the things that you also did was you cited Alexander Hamilton in your statement that you shared with us today. That's correct. I found that ironic also because Alexander Hamilton founded the Federalist Party and founded the National Bank and also the Federal Reserve, which a lot of people in South Carolina aren't real happy about right now. So I guess my question for you is, do you understand that in a federal system that there are federal agencies who have a responsibility to operate within that constitutional framework and do their du duty free of interference from outside parties in order for that to be fundamentally fair to all of the parties involved? May I state my opinion? Yes. My opinion is, is that the law is being misapplied by the National Labor Relations Board. It is my duty to protect and defend the Constitution when the Constitution itself is not being attacked, and I believe that is what I am doing, Representative. Well, you made a statement in an opinion piece you published in the state on Wednesday, June 1st of 2011, where you accused the President of being silent, and you wrote, the president's silence is consent akin to a parent in a grocery store refusing to control an unruly child. As a result, the labor board has been given the green light to wage war on commerce and industry. Do you remember writing that? Yes, I do. Did, does Governor Haley have the legal authority to control your actions and tell you what to do as head of the Justice Department of the state of South Carolina? She does not. So would you expect President Obama to have the ability to control his administrative agency officials in carrying out their responsibility under the Constitution? Representative, two of the board members are recess appointed members who have circumvented Senate confirmation, including the acting general counsel. Well, Secondly, wait a second. That well, happens I'm all the time. Answer. A recess appointment is not something that's bizarre or unusual. It's a practical reality of the political consequence of confirmation in the Senate, isn't it? Representative, the President, who I want to see be successful because when he fails, we all fail, but his actions are leading us down the wrong path. That's not my let question. Me, let me explain. My question for you is, isn't that a practical consequence of the difficult confirmation process that we have seen get increasingly partisan for any Senate confirmation. The fact that there are recess appointments does not in any way diminish the fact that they have a sworn obligation to uphold the law of the United States. Representative, I would like to see the President speak it out. He doesn't have to get involved in the independent agency's actions. But when his own chief of staff uh, voted on the board of Boeing to unanimously to locate Boeing to South Carolina, y'all are all saying that the chief of staff of the President of the United States violated federal law. I would like the President of the United States either to defend his chief of staff's actions or at least say that the actions of this board could have dire economic consequences. Which for chief of staff are you talking about? Mr. Daly. Bill Daly. Yes, sir. Okay. So when you talk about his responsibility, are you talking about his role as chief of staff to have a, an obligation to direct the president to take action? These were Mr. Daly's actions prior to chief of staff, but if my chief of staff violated federal law, I would certainly speak out against it. The point is, Representative, that I would like to see the, pres the president out there talking about building manufacturing jobs through private and public cooperation and partnerships, but at the same time, he has an agency out there that is doing everything contrary to that effort. And I would like to see the President get out there and talk about when you do things that cause CEOs of businesses to not want to come to states. This hurts union states more than right to work states. This, this hurts us all. I would like to see the President speak to that. Whether or not he gets involved with Mr. Solomon's case is irrelevant, and I respect the independence of that agency, and I respect the President for staying out of that. But speaking out on the effects that this could have on, on our global economy is paramount. Well, I'm, I'm glad we agree that it's important to maintain the integrity of the adjudicative process, and I yield back my time. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, 
In light of our colleagues' uh, comments about the uh, rich and pro provocative, uh, at times, history of our great state, it is uh, my pleasure to recognize my colleague from Charleston, Mr. Tim Scott. <laughs> as uh, our chairman has referred to me as Congressman Timmy, uh, <laughs> I do not want this to be taken away from my time. But um, my good friend on the end there started a process of asking questions that really compared apples to oranges. So let me make sure that I have this straight. Uh, Mr. Wilson, did the governor appoint you? No. Did the president appoint Mr. Solomon? Yes. Governor, does the Attorney General of South Carolina serve at your pleasure no, or the people's pleasure? No, at the people's pleasure. Are you sure? I am positive. Are you all sure? Yes. yes. We're sure. Okay. Does Mr. Solomon serve at the pleasure of the president? Would you concur? Yes. Okay. I wanted to make sure that we had those facts straight. When, we, when, it's, when we're talking about the return on investment of the $900 million that South Carolina uh, invested, not gave or spent, but invested in Boeing, is it unprecedented for us to reserve a return on investment of $14 for every dollar invested according to the Post and Courier, per Courier's analysis of the economic development package? So, question, if you had an opportunity to invest a dollar and get $14 back, would you do it every day, every other day, or once a week? <laughs> Because I still want to understand this. We would do it all the time. Okay. <laughs> so we can get another one of those tomorrow on Saturday. You'll I'm come into it. work and you'll I'm sign on. <laughs> okay. Let, let, let's not get confused by the mumble jumble of politicians. I mean, when you think about this as a simple return on investment, the Boeing Corporation's decision to invest their resources in our soil is, in fact, a solid return on investment for the people of South Carolina. Yes, and Congressman, I will tell you this. It doesn't take an attorney general. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to look at this and see that this is flat out wrong. This isn't wrong for South Carolina. This is wrong for every state in the country. And I will tell you that the actions that are taken in reference to this National Labor Relations Board move will impact our country forever. This is serious. I don't want any other governor to have to go through what we're having to go through. And I will tell you that when you were talking about retaliation, <coughs> The yes. retaliation is coming from the president. The retaliation is coming from the NLRB. It is not coming from Boeing. I'm glad you brought up the, the case of global of this global economy. When you think about our competition in this state, are we simply competing against Georgia or North Carolina or Washington State? When your top prospects call into your office looking for an opportunity to do business anywhere, do they simply say it's either you guys or North Dakota? Or we, Texas? Well, I'm right now talking with international companies. We're talking to companies from India. We're talking to companies from Germany. We're talking to several companies outside of the United States. This doesn't just keep them from coming to South Carolina. This keeps them from even looking at any state in our country when they see that something like this can happen. With a 9.1% national unemployment, with a double-digit unemployment in South Carolina, does this feel like a joke to you? This is not funny. Thank you. Mr. Wilson. When you take into consideration the comments made about the constitutional responsibilities of your office, do you take into consideration the fact that the Ninth and the Tenth Amendments of our Constitution allows for states to have autonomy over what creates a workable atmosphere for employment opportunities? I do. So do you believe that the right to work laws that are in our state help us or hurt us? I believe they help us. Thank you, sir. No further questions. Uh, I want to thank uh, Madam Governor, thank you again for your, your presence, your testimony, and uh, your leadership on this issue. Mr. Attorney General, uh, wonderful to see you. Not sure why your father uh, didn't want to be <laughs> present uh, for it, but we'll investigate that and get back to you on it. <laughs> on behalf of all of us uh, on both sides, uh, thank you um, for being here. And to my colleagues who are not from South Carolina, uh, thank you for visiting our state. And if there's anything uh, Tim or I or Joe or anyone else could do to make the remainder of your stay more hospitable, please let us know. With that, uh, we are recessed.